Hello everyone and welcome. Thank you all for joining us today for this live stream event. My name is Albena and I'm the program and event manager of the Microsoft Reactor San Francisco. I will be sharing session resources with you in the chat, but before we begin, I would like to quickly review two items with you, our code of conduct and event guidelines. First, please take a moment to review our code of conduct Microsoft Reactor seeks to provide a respectful environment for both our audience and presenters. We do encourage engagement in the chat, but please be mindful of your commentary, remain professional and on topic. And secondly, our event guidelines. This session is being recorded and will be available on demand through the Microsoft Reactor YouTube channel in about 24 to 48 hours. I'll be sharing the link in the chat for our YouTube channel. And if you have not been on a live stream through YouTube before, please know that you must also create an account on YouTube in order to access and interact in the chat. You can set that up right now. And if you're unable to use the chat, but have questions, please feel free to reach out to us through social media or Meetup. Which brings us to today's session, Mixed Reality Toolkit 3, the Reactor Code Lab. This session will run for approximately 60 minutes. I'm going to bring in our speaker for today, who is Sam Ronsky. Uh, he's a Microsoft Cloud Advocate. Hi, Sam. Hello, thank you so much. Uh, and hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Sam Ronsky. I'm a regional cloud advocate here at Microsoft. My job is to help empower all of you to build awesome things with Microsoft technologies. Today, we're going to be taking a look at the Mixed Reality Toolkit, um, or MRTK3. Um, this is a project that I'm slowly ramping up on and do not know much about. Um, sort of the premise of this show is that we're going to learn things together. Um, and so that's exactly what we're doing here. Um, the Mixed Reality Toolkit lets you build tools um, or apps for mixed reality devices, whether that's the HoloLens or a uh, MetaQuest or some other OpenXR platform. Like uh, I'm going to be using a Valve Index. Um, and so we're going to be able to build things like that. Uh, and then you do that all using Unity. Um, so you can use all the things that you're familiar with in Unity to build really cool things um, that work in mixed reality. Um, typically, I have rolled my own solutions for a lot of this stuff. I've gone and built my own buttons, and I've built my own physics interactions uh, and how objects are picked up and dropped in a mixed reality environment. Uh, we're we're going to try to do something a little bit um, different than that, so it's something that gives us a little bit more um, out of the box, so we don't have to roll everything ourselves, uh, and we can kind of use a set of predefined things that work on more than just the device that we're building for. Uh, so that's what we're going to be kind of exploring today. Um, there's a bunch of information here, um, so you can kind of walk through and check out what this is. Most of the platforms are currently experimental. This is a relatively new thing, um, so uh, keep that in mind. Um, I am using one of the experimental devices for for this, um, just because that's the device I have. Um, so we're, we're gonna we're gonna be tinkering with that. Um, and if you would like to play around with it, you can go and check it out on GitHub, um, which is right here. Um, so. This is the project on GitHub. This is actually what we're going to be playing with. I've already forked this uh, and have this in uh, Unity right now. Um, so it's ready to run. Um, but you can use this. You need uh, Unity 2020 point something uh, in order to run this. Uh, that is listed somewhere in here. Um, but yeah, 2020.3 or greater in order to use this. Uh, and if you have that, then you should be good to go. You're ready to, ready to start using this. Um, I'm using Unity 2021. Um, point three, I think, which is, yeah, 2021.3.4. Um, so you can uh, play around with this. Um, and so how this works is you just need to fork this repo um, or clone this locally and then make sure you're on the correct branch. Um, so the MRTK3 branch, if you just clone this on GitHub, you're going to get a different one. Uh, make sure you double check that and then switch over your branch so that you're pointing to the correct project. Use that and then you're good to go. Um, and that's as much as I've done. <laughs> um, that's all, all I know about this. Uh, and so I have poked a little bit at this just to figure out what's going on. Um, there are two ways to get started with this. This is one of them. Um, so there are 
two places. If you go into setup, um, the first suggestion is to clone the repository. That's what I just walked through. That's that's how you get started. That's what I did. But if you're actually wanting to use this in your own project, you probably don't need all of the tutorials and samples and things that come along with that project. Because um, there's a bunch of extra scenes and a bunch of extra assets and a bunch of other stuff that you may not be using in whatever you're building. And so the other option is to actually slowly start adding those projects into a new project. So you can create a new project inside of Unity and start adding the components that you need. Um, there are different pieces of this whole component that get added individually. So you don't need to take the entire toolkit. You can just take the parts that you need. Um, so not doing that for this because uh, uh, starting from scratch would be less interesting, I feel like. So we're, we're starting with some of the samples and things that already exist. And we're just going to kind of tinker with them and see what we can make out of that and figure out sort of how this stuff works and how you can use this to, to build your own projects. Um, whether that's just a, a personal project that you're trying to build uh, for the for the quest or for whatever, um, this will give you something that allows you to kind of take some of the cool components. Um, the UI features looked really interesting. And then take those and bring them into something that's compatible with the uh, meta quest or compatible with another mixed reality device or compatible with the HoloLens. You can make it so it works kind of nicely across all of them. Uh, so that's what we're going to be working with. <laughs> so. That's that. Let's let's just jump into it. <laughs> um, so uh, we're going to be kind of tinkering with this. I have a, hopefully set this up so you can actually see what I can see inside of VR. Um, but just just throwing it out there that recording and live streaming VR content is kind of difficult, um, especially if you're you're just sitting at home. <laughs> so we're going to do our best uh, and try to make this work. Uh, but that that's that's what we're going to do. <laughs> so. This is, I think, probably the best place to start. And this is also the only thing that I have done. Um, so if I run this, there are a few different ways. If you're new to mixed reality inside of Unity, there are a few different things you can do to kind of set this up. I have a um, OpenXR, which is the open uh, platform for mixed reality, um, running through Steam VR. So Steam VR is running and connecting to this. <laughs> this is my headset, and you can actually see. When I move the headset, uh, it, it moves. <laughs> so as, as I look, it's highlighting different things. And what this demo is intended to do is show, sort of highlight glance viewing. Um, because when you're actually inside, you might want to know what is somebody looking at? What component in the scene is somebody trying to look at? And so what this is doing is highlighting in red the component that we're staring at. Um, you might notice this is off by a little bit. Um, so like that red box is on the right side of the screen. This is because it's only showing you one of the eyes inside of this device. Um, so, so you're getting it shifted a little bit. Um, but what that is kind of giving you is a, is a pl place to kind of figure out where is the player looking in my scene. So um, we're going to kind of figure out how all of this works. Uh, the interesting thing is this is all done with like native Unity type stuff. Uh, so if you've used Unity before, hopefully, um, it's fairly, fairly common or something you've done before. Uh, and the way that's handled is in the stateful interactable. So all of these things are just cubes. Uh, they have a cube mesh and then the box collider attached to them, um, which we can probably change if we want to. <laughs> let's let's do that next. Um, and so what we do is we make them interactable. We, so we say is interactable and check that box. And then we give it a selection mode. I have no idea what this is. Um, button, I assume, is a way for us to actually uh, treat them like a button. So it's like an impulse where the toggle would be on or off. And then the other thing we have is a bunch of events. So if you've used Unity, Unity's UI, this should feel familiar because <laughs> it, it's working the same way. You have a, events for clicking a button. So if we don't want to actually click this, we can end an event, but we're not clicking this thing. Uh, we're just looking at it. So what we're doing is actually uh, finding other things. So if we actually look down here to our MRTK events, uh, we can see a bunch of different other things. Um, so there's a bunch of other events that get added to this component that lets you detect when things are gazed at. So in this case, we have is gaze hovered. 
Um, and uh, something else. I don't even know how this doesn't look away. Oh, it's all in one place. Perfect. Um, again, I'm still learning this, so uh, yeah. <laughs> but we have is gaze hovered is going to change the material of the cube we're looking at into a red mesh. And then when we move away, it changes back to a white mesh. So all we're doing is just swapping the material that we're, we have on this assigned to this object whenever we look at it. And so that gives us a way to kind of swap things out. <laughs> so if we look at this, uh, you can see we have the same thing. Uh, I believe, though, I, so based off of that, my expectation is that we actually go back to a different material, and we do. Um, so now, instead of going back to the white material like all the others, we're actually going back to this gem material. Well, let's switch this. <laughs> um, let's make it uh, cyan, I guess. Uh, and so we're, what this should do is now when I look at this item and then look away, it should switch instead of back to this gem pattern, it should shift back to the cyan pattern. Um, so some new material for us. Um, so um, this is uh, one of the things. There we go. So now it's switched to cyan. Um, so <laughs> that's working. Uh, this is a little clunky as far as testing goes, um, just because we're having to like manipulate a headset. Uh, I haven't found a great way. So it's sort of in my own development, kind of trying to figure out the best way to actually work with this and what the best pipeline pipeline is for kind of working in these environments. But this seems to work. Um, typically, I find I'm either just doing a really quick check to see if something works or looking at the scene view like right now, uh, everything is still running um, so I can actually see where my gaze is cast through the scene. Um, that's that those blue lines there. Um, I've either done that and just kind of held the headset or just thrown it on really quickly. Um, right now, that's a little bit weird, but that's a separate thing. Uh, there are also emulators. So one of the default tools that is actually recommended with this uh, toolkit is an emulator that will allow you to kind of run these devices as an emulated device on your computer. So you don't need hardware in order to actually develop for them. Um, you don't need to actually like own the device or be like manipulating it all over the place. I've personally found that I kind of like it. Um, it makes me feel it makes it feel a little bit more intuitive for me to actually try that. But uh, depending on your style of work or what you're trying to do, it might make different sense. Um, most of the work that I've done is like dynamic interactions, which is what this toolkit should help me with. Um, so that's what we're going to be kind of tinkering with. Anyway, uh, that is all of that. The other thing I want to change is my understanding, just based off of how this is all working, is that there is a Raycast getting uh, sent out from our headset like this. So we have these blue lines going into our scene. My assumption is that that's a Raycast that we can actually take and uh, interact with our object. So what if we want something that's more complicated, that has a more complicated geometry? than this, <laughs> than just a cube. Uh, so let's try to swap that out. Let's go with a sphere. And we're just going to uh, remove the box collider and add in our sphere instead. And then just for fun, we're going to switch this to actually use a sphere. Uh, so now we have a sphere attached to this wall instead of just relying on everything else we've done. So if I run this now, everything should still work. Um, we'll just have a slightly different detection for what we're actually looking at. Um, or no scene at all. There we go. But uh, this, I don't know a good way to actually demo this. <laughs> um, I didn't really think that part through. Uh, but maybe in the scene view, it'll be a little bit easier. Or it'll freeze. That's cool. <laughs> um, what did I do? Uh, I'm not entirely sure. Oh, I lost tracking. That's my bad. <laughs> cool. All right. So there you can see we're kind of missing our cube, or our sphere, uh, until we get really close. Um, it's hard to demo, <laughs> but 
there we go. So I think you can swap out these collisions and actually do different things with that. Um, and it's all based off of this event system. So if you're, again, familiar with Unity's event system, this should translate into that. So you can just start attaching to different things. Um, just to kind of go through what that is, if you're unfamiliar, um, let's add a click event. Is that a good idea? Um, probably not. <laughs> let's, let's look at this. Um, so when we enter the gaze, what you can do is actually add a series of events that get called. So certain things that happen. Unity gives you the option of either invoking a function. So you can either have, have a function and call that, or you can actually change some property somewhere in your scene. Um, so you can just select any of the objects in your scene. Uh, it turns out there's a few. <laughs> um, so here's all the objects currently in our scene. Uh, and we could pick one of them. I believe this is our current cube, uh, cube 10, because it's the only one that's a sphere. <laughs> um, so we can pick those and use them as a way to actually interact with these different things. And then we can select that maybe that one. Uh, and say invoke a function. So let's go and change this color to a something else. <laughs> um, let's go and find its mesh render and change its material to a yellow. Is there a yellow? So all of these materials are kind of included with uh, the sample project. So if you download this, you're going to get all these materials along with it. Um, so sorry, I thought I thought I would get a yellow, <laughs> but I'm not. Uh, so we're just going to swap it to this matte gray. Um, and so what this should do is now when I actually look into this scene and view that specific sphere, we should also see one of the objects also turn. Let's go up here. <laughs> and if we look at that, now you can see this one has turned gray. And so that's because we swapped the material. So we changed that top objects material to gray as well. Um, this is just a quick, I guess, overview of how the event system works. So you can actually see how that all, that's all functioning. Um, but this gives a really quick um, demo of this part of this. Um, so that's just the gaze part. I'm not sure that's the most interesting part of this, but it is probably the quickest way to kind of like get your head around it. Um, some of the other ones get a little bit more uh, involved <laughs> um, and I haven't really played too much with them. So what, what I really want to look at is sort of the UI parts. Um, I've always found that doing UI inside of VR gets really difficult. Um, and this actually provides a whole framework for doing UI stuff. It doesn't just like give you a text renderer that you can do. It actually gives you a way to actually make objects that you can grab and manipulate and, and actually interact with. Um, and it should work with whatever controllers you're using. So I'm using uh, a set of index controllers, but it should also support things like um, HoloLens gestures and things like that. Uh, so let's just pick one. <laughs> um, Let's go and try the bounds control example. Um, you can find more documentation about a lot of this stuff on the website. So if this is something you're interested in and you want to try it out um, and you don't want to just kind of like tinker with this and see what these things do, you can actually just go and find documentation about each of these packages. Um, so we've kind of gone through most of this and then moved on into uh, sample scenes. And so you can see all of these fun things. Uh, I think I just opened the bounds control. I hope that's the one I opened. <laughs> um, and so what we can do is kind of run this. This might take a little bit more. Um, let me stop hitting my mic. And hopefully, perfect. OK, <laughs> I'm going to disappear for a second. Let's see here. I do this. <laughs> all right. So now you can see all of the different types of objects. So I can actually grab cups and things like that and actually move them around in my scene. 
uh, I can grab different buttons, move those, or grab this piece of cheese. Um, and you can even turn these bounds on and off. You can see we're getting this fun rendered cube that has nice outlines around it. Um, so you can actually work with those to kind of do whatever you want um, or grab both of them. The difference between these is one is occluded, which means it doesn't show the background um, lines. So the ones back here, um, whereas this one is, is hiding those. Um, and then we can also have a setting for actually enabling bounds so you can actually see them constantly versus not see them at all. And I think you can even grow and shrink controls because of those bounds. I can make this uh, setting bigger um, or this button bigger or, or however I want. Um, so you can kind of change things how you, how you feel like. Um, and there is documentation in the scene about how to actually use these things. I think I can make this, no. <laughs> but you can see this too. Uh, and so I'm gonna try not to run into my room. All right, um, let's bring me back. <laughs> awesome, welcome back. <laughs> um, so that's, I guess, a, a really quick example of how to actually interact with these things. Um, and that's bounds control. What that is, is actually giving you a boundary, a bounding box, basically around the object that you can interact with um, that even has handles in some cases, so you can make it bigger or smaller, depending on what you're trying to do. So you're trying to actually make like a dynamic UI that the player can take with them or do whatever. That gives you a way to do that. Or if you want just a dialogue box that maybe should be bigger so you can actually read it and then compressed back down so that it goes away. That also gives you an option for doing that. Um, so <laughs> what I want to do is figure out how does this actually work? Um, because I do not know. Um, one other thing I've noticed uh, these gizmos are really big. Um, so if if you have, I think, the default settings for Unity, your scenes might look like this. Uh, and that's mostly because you have a bunch of like Tech Smash Pro stuff um, and a bunch of audio giddy, uh, gizmos and things like that. There's a lot. Um, you can change those. Um, I click this little sphere in the top right up here. And that actually lets you turn on and off different gizmo settings in Unity. Um, so you can see there's a bunch um, and you can turn off either the icons that are getting drawn per script or you can turn off the gizmos, which is on the right hand side here, the check boxes. Um, so the gizmos are going to be things like this um, blue lines here drawing through our scene. If you don't want that, this gives you a way to turn that off. But you can also just shrink down the 3D icons and just make them much smaller so they are uh, less intrusive when they're so densely packed like that. So you, this way, the, the rest of the scene is not occluded anymore by a whole bunch of gizmos, because this is a little bit a lot. <laughs> um, so this gives us a way to kind of get this out of the way so we can actually see how this scene looks. And this is what it is. <laughs> so this, this is what we were playing with. Um, we have this ability to kind of grab these coffee cups and things like that. Um, I'm not entirely sure what all of these uh, splines going everywhere are. I'm pretty sure it's ways of things interacting with one another. But I, it's, I'm not super familiar. <laughs> um, so I think there's something going on, but that's something that I'm not super familiar with. It's just not something that I've worked with before. Um, so I think what we want, though, is this bounds control which is actually giving us a, the ability to kind of control these bounding boxes. Um, so I, if I remember, this cup is not resizable. It would be cool if it was, so we can make a bigger cup of coffee. So I don't know how to do that. Let's figure it out. <laughs> um, so uh, it looks like the way this works is you have a manipulation and you can give it a rotation and a scale and a translation but we were translating it, so that must not be it. Um, let's go and find some of the documentation for this. Uh, so if we go in here, and I believe we can just go and search for bounds. And we should find something. Um, we might get back to this page. Uh, but there we go, bounds control. Uh, so 
this is what we were seeing. And so what I, um, <laughs> I'm usually in favor of a bigger cup of coffee. Me too. Uh, I'm more of a tea person, uh, but the more caffeine, the better, I feel like. So especially in the morning. Yeah, <laughs> it's all it can't go wrong. Uh, so let's figure out how to actually make it so we can actually make it bigger. <laughs> um, the bounds visual prefab. Um, we were getting intent only, I think, which is what this is where you just have a circle around the thing that kind of shows you this can be in gate or interacted with and can be highlighted. Um, so it's it's kind of showing you that this is an object that you can pick up um, and kind of giving you an outline. Uh, similar to like if I hover over a link on this page, we get an underline. It's the same idea, but we're just doing this in 3D and giving you a nice cube around that. Um, so and then there's a legacy and interaction style. Um, so we have focus and then activated. I don't know what activated means, but um, I guess we'll figure that out. Uh, bounds control can be used for manipulating 2D content as well. Um, if flatten mode is set to auto, the bounds control will flatten itself to a 2D rectangle. So that's what we had here. Uh, so, oops. Uh, in this case, we had these two buttons that are flattened. Um, so this way we have an actual panel, basically, like a, I guess, floating holographic projection of whatever we want to look at. Um, in this case, it's just a button that we can kind of move around, but you could do entire panels of text. So like this one, <laughs> this one we were using um, and so forth. Uh, so how is this working? Uh, that gives us the ability to scale it. Was I wrong? Could we could we scale this coffee? <laughs> let me let me check. Uh, Going to switch back to our VR view. There we go. And we are very close. <laughs> let me grab my other hand. There we go. All right. So if we grab this, uh, I don't think we can make these bigger. Oh, we can. OK. Cool. OK, so so we have this set so we can rotate and we can scale this. Um, we've enabled those inside the settings. Uh, so if we want like a really nice uh, espresso, I guess <laughs> we can make it really small uh, or really big, uh, depending on what you prefer. And then in this case, we just have handles on versus handles off so we can make it bigger or smaller. Uh, so. <laughs> Insert joke about Java. I, I like that too. <laughs> Lots of jokes. Nice. I like it. Uh, let's go and say hi again. All right. Um, doing VR stuff, it is like 100 degrees right now in San Francisco. So uh, <laughs> this timing wise, this was not great on my part, but uh, <laughs> that's how that works. So what I would be curious about is, can we turn that off? Maybe we don't want people to be able to make all of our game objects bigger. Um, maybe, maybe that's not something that we will want people to be able to do. Um, for example, if you just want people to be able to pick up a box and move it inside of your scene, but not make it bigger, can we do that? Um, if we turn off scale here, so I can only rotate this, does that work? Or <laughs> OK, let's let's keep that one the way it is. So I turned off scaling on the left coffee cup, but let's make the other one non uniform. Um, so uniform scaling means every dimension scales identically. Um, so if we scale it horizontally, it will also scale vertically and in depth. But if we turn that off, we can make like a really tall <laughs> coffee cup that wasn't very long or some, something like that. Uh, so let's see if this works. Um, so let, let's run this again and see what happens. Uh, so I'm going to switch back. And we will try this. <laughs> All right. Uh, so this one should only be able to can still scale. And this one also can still scale. So I don't think that was the right setting. 
that must be interacting with something else. Um, <laughs> let me go and figure out what I did wrong. So if we go and look at this, or is it resetting? So if I run this, does it change? <laughs> um, no, okay. That's just me being weird. Um, so that's cool. Uh, but why can we not limit it? And what is this doing? I've, so I feel like I might be looking in the wrong place because this is looking at a transform that is undefined. So I, I'm assuming this transform is something that we would have control over and we would be limiting the types of in, uh, interactions we have with that transform. But it's not defined. Um, so I'm not entirely sure what it's pointed at. Um, and I, I haven't used this toolkit enough to, to know which one. Um, but this seems useful. Um, so we have a min-max scale constraint that's actually looking at the types of things that we can actually scale. Uh, so this might be something that we could take a look at. Um, let's see here. OK, <laughs> um, that might be useful. I'm curious how everything is interacting with one another. So we have an object manipulator, um, which I believe is how we actually are manipulating different types of objects. Um, am I the only type of person who thinks of open look when I see these resize handles? I have never used that. Um, I, I, I guess I, I'm not super familiar. Most of my VR experience uh, is very focused on like the gaming side, not like the uh, industrial application side um, or anything like that. Whereas, uh, and then some experience with mixed reality or like mixed reality stuff where you actually have AR stuff projected into screens, but that is something I'm less familiar with. Uh, so. Oh, is this what's going on? OK. So I think I was looking in the wrong place. We have a bounds control. And I think this is controlling how you manipulate the specific transform. Uh, so what you might be able to do is actually uh, create that bound and actually assign it to a different transform. We can try that later um, and actually be able to scale and uh, re reduce something else by manipulating a specific boundary. Um, sort of like a slider, for example, might, might be useful for like increasing the size of an object. Um, but we also have this object manipulator with a uh, allowed manipulations. So let's turn off scale so we can just move and rotate this object. Um, and then in this one, let's make it so we can't do anything except make it bigger. Um, so let's go and turn off our rotation and our movement. So the left hand one can only get bigger. It's the only thing we're going to allow that to happen. And then the other one can be moved and rotated, but it can't be increased in size. Um, and so that's both of those. And then interaction types is going to be the types of things we can do to this. Um, so we have near, which I believe is touch. Um, and then gaze is what we were experimenting with earlier, where you, where you could actually look at things. Um, and then uh, the other ones are for different other interactions. Um, so now what? Uh, rotate around grab point. Oh, OK, so you can actually change how uh, rotations and things work. So if you're trying to like grab an object and rotate it, um, typically I think you'd want it to rotate around what you're grabbing. Um, so if you grab an object and try to rotate it, you want it to rotate around your wrist, around your hand. But you might not actually want to do that. Maybe you want like a wheel that you can spin in place, but you can't just go and like take it and turn it sideways, for example, or do some other weird manipulation because of the way it is. You want it to spin around itself. Um, so this might give you a way to do that. Um, I would have to play with that a little bit more, but maybe there's some fun stuff you could do there. <laughs> so. Let's double check and make sure we're on the right track here. 
and that we've actually limited the correct manipulations here. Uh, and then we can come back and actually play with a little bit more about trying to do this. But first, um, we're going to go down here and we're going to make sure uh, we can make this coffee much bigger. Um, so let's do this. And run this. So now that coffee cup can get very, very large. Um, I'm going to switch back to my VR view. All right, so everything looks the same, and I lost tracking there, but that's okay. So I can move this cup, but I can't make it bigger. Um, so the scaling action doesn't work anymore on this. It just kind of is, is a cup of whatever whatever size we, we created it at. Whereas this one, I can't move at all. So I can grab it and, uh, I guess, rotate it in place, but I can't do anything else. And I actually get a different set of handles for this. So whereas this one doesn't have any handles assigned to it, this one does for scaling. So I can actually think. Make it bigger or not. What have I done? <laughs> I'm not entirely sure what's going on there. Let me see what I've done wrong. Because uh, that doesn't seem right. <laughs> um, uh, so. Um, oh, we're getting some weird. Weird stuff. Uh, why? Isn't that doing quite what I thought? Um, so we can scale this. That's what we've assigned. And then we can rotate it around the grab point. But. We weren't able to scale this is the thing that I'm confused about, I guess. Um, maybe we move on and try something else. I'm not entirely sure. I think I'm thinking the right things. I'm just not executing them correctly, and I'm not sure quite what. And so let's explore some other things while I think about this a little bit more. <laughs> so that, I guess, is bounding boxes. That gives you the ability to actually manipulate objects and grab objects and do things with those objects. Um, so my understanding is this bounds control is what's actually handling drawing those different types of controls. Those things that actually allow you to, oh, interact with it and do different things. Uh, that's probably why. <laughs> um, I think I had the wrong thing selected. Uh, so that makes some sense. <laughs> um, let's leave that. Um, but there we go. Uh, so we have different things that we can manipulate to kind of change how these things are working together and how all of that's going to work. Um, this was one of the things that seemed really neat when I was kind of looking at it is it gives you a way to kind of interact with objects and it's a pretty clear way to do it. Um, typically I've seen like some sort of holographic thing or some sort of glow outline around objects to kind of show that you're, high, you're grabbing them. This kind of gives you that without having to like write a shader or do any custom work to do that which is kind of nice. Uh, so let's go and jump to something else. <laughs> let's go and try to find some UI stuff. And I'm not entirely sure where, so we're just going to open a bunch of different things and see which one looks interesting. <laughs> um, uh, that's a whole bunch of different objects. That's OK. Uh, UI stuff, dialogue. Nope. <laughs> um, so th this is the one I was looking for. Um, so this is a hand interaction scene. So this is intended for actually showing like how you you can actually interact with different uh, things inside of your scene. There we go. Got there eventually. Um, so it's got some really fun things kind of pre-built there, um, including a pen that you can draw with, um, a piano that you can play a bunch of different buttons, like 3D buttons that you can actually interact with with your fingers. Um, and the cool thing is this is compatible with HoloLens, but it's also compatible with things like my device, which is not a HoloLens. Um, so depending on what you're actually trying to do here, you can actually 
work with all of these things. Uh, so let's run this and I can quickly kind of talk about what everything is doing. Um, and then we can come back and I can kind of investigate further for the rest of this kind of how all of this stuff works. Um, Cause I think it'll be pretty cool. Uh, so let's run this and switch over my camera. <laughs> All right. Um, so this is the this is the demo scene for this. Um, one of the cool things is you get this really cool holographic display. Um, so you can see there's a bunch of extra things. Um, this does call out that you do need to be using a specific type of uh, depth uh, process in order to do this. So you need to have a specific depth uh, quality assigned in order to use this. It's labeled right here. Uh, if you're trying trying to use that, but it gives you this really cool holographic effect that I would use for like cards or something. <laughs> um, but then we also get other fun things. Um, so I just played music. Um, we have a piano, uh, and I don't think the stream receives my audio, but you do get audio played whenever you push a key down, and it's a different type of audio depending on what you do. So you can actually play this um, for an index like I'm using. The pointer fingers are the ones that actually press things. The other fingers don't do anything. Um, so that's how that works. You kind of get one finger to kind of play whatever you want. <laughs> um, and we also get different uh, UI things. Um, and these are sort of tactile, so you just push them. Um, and everything, everything you do kind of interacts with them. So if you just poke them with your finger, you get a UI thing. Um, this works for these buttons as well. So if we want to actually push these, uh, you do get a sound with these, but uh, that might not come across on, on the screen. Uh, same thing with this, you get another button. Uh, and so if you need to create like a fun UI, this gives you a way to do that. Um, and then, oh, I can move the entire thing. That's neat. <laughs> So we can just kind of grab the entire scene and move that. Uh, and then we can grab, for example, this pen and do some writing here. Uh, there we go. Uh, this was supposed to be a smiley face, but uh, nope, it's not. <laughs> so there we go. And then also you can have objects that you can pick up that also have gravity. So I can actually drop this and it will just fall into nothingness um, and then eventually come back. Uh, so this gives us a kind of a fun way to, to try different things in this in sort of an interactive way. So we have some sort of interactive canvas to kind of play around in VR and do different things. Um, so that's how all of that works. Um, kind of gives you a fun playground of different, different things you can do. Uh, and this is sort of the, I guess demo where I was like, oh, I want to, I want to try this um, because this stuff, I, at least I found quite difficult because I always did it with like straight physics uh, and that didn't work great for me. Um, so also uh, this shader was just interesting. Um, so that's, that's me. <laughs> um, but in this case, I want to kind of figure out how these buttons work. Um, because I think that's, for me, that's going to be one of the things that I actually really want to actually use. Is actually something where you can actually go up to an object inside of a, a VR world or inside of a, a mixed reality world and kind of touch something and have it do something. I feel like that's one of the coolest experiences of the entire, this entire type of experiences. It's something where you can actually just work <laughs> with whatever it is. Uh, I need to switch my camera back. Cool. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so uh, let's go and look at how this pressable button works. The thing is, it's the exact same. Um, at least it looks like it's the exact same uh, as everything else we had. So when we were looking at those gaze objects, we had a button basically that we were looking at to see if we were looking at it or not. Um, so in this case, is gaze hovered is what we were using to kind of change the material of different objects. In this case, 
we've just added an on clicked interaction. And then I imagine there are some settings somewhere that let us define how all of this actually moves. Um, and I'm not entirely sure where those are, but I'm sure we can find it. Uh, maybe. <laughs> um, uh, so, Interaction Manager Collider. So nothing in there or in here. Interesting, okay. Okay, so I think this is sort of what's actually doing the interaction part. Um, this looks sort of, sort of like what I was expecting to see. Um, we have a start push plane and a end push plane. Uh, I'm curious. So in this case, there are two this object. Let's do that. Uh, that'll, that'll be a little bit nicer than me trying to manually zoom in on this. Um, but we have two cylinders, basically. We have that white one, which is the base of our button. And then we have the green bit, which is the part that we can actually push. That green bit is just this. So there's nothing actually, there's no scripts attached to this at all. Uh, there isn't even any attached to this. <laughs> um, so that is just a visual element that's just there to kind of showcase uh, and give you something to actually touch. And then it looks like. Uh, <laughs> all right, I need to get better at using this, um, but we have two different types of gizmos here. There's a lot on the screen right now, and I do apologize for that. Um, but we do have this green box oh, and they're labeled. Perfect. <laughs> um, and then we have this like cyan thing, um, the cyan square, which is sort of the start push and the blue, which is the end push, um, which are the two planes that I think we're moving between. So our button starts getting pushed when it passes that first one and then ends getting pushed and probably triggers the click when it gets to the final depression of wherever it's trying to get to. Um, so that's how you actually engage with the button. Um, and I think those are defined here, so we can actually change this, I think. And you can see this is actually moving that button uh, wherever we set it to. Um, so this will give it kind of the wherever it starts. And then wherever it ends is going to be how far in you have to actually push whatever that is in order to get it to engage and do whatever it's supposed to be doing. Um, so in this case, we need to push it uh, like 0.15 meters or whatever um, inside of the game in order to actually cause that to get pushed. Uh, so we can probably move this if we want. And so if I put this like way behind the button, um, keep in mind the button is scaled by quite a bit. Um, and so I imagine these are scaling as well. Um, so this very long distance of like, I just assigned it to basically one meter. The button is then scaled down by like 20 times. So it's not that anymore. It's much smaller, um, but this gives us a kind of a way to do that. We also have things like extending speed and returning speed. So we can actually change how fast things go back and forth. So it's not just instantly when you release the button, it automatically goes back. Um, there will be some effect. <laughs> so it has has a little bit of smoothing going on. So it's a little bit nicer. Uh, so let's try this. Uh, that's it. what this should have done is make that green button take a lot more to actually push than the yellow one. Um, so the yellow one will get depressed just slightly, whereas the green button should go like through <laughs> the thing, um, which I, I guess we're going to see what happens. Um, so let's just run this and see what see what what that changed. Um, if I'm correct, we now have the ability to actually move this thing further down and actually change how this is working. So if you're changing your art assets, for example, you have some custom art and you want that to work. This might give you a way to do that. Uh, but let me swap over here. And there we go. Right. 
So. Here's my hands. Um, so we can push this yellow button again. Uh, or this green one, you can see it goes all the way through. Um, so we can actually, like, they're different. <laughs> um, and losing tracking. Oops. Uh, so this, this kind of gives you a different way to kind of change how these are actually being, being used inside of your game. Um, and then again, all this other stuff kind of does its stuff. Um, so that, I guess, is that. So that that's what gives you a way to, um, I guess, quickly change how your settings are actually working. So you actually have a way to alter that. So you can actually change what you're doing and how all of that's actually working. Um, we probably don't want it to go to require that much of a depression, but it gives you the ability to kind of change that. Um, so again, my feeling is this would be useful if you're trying to do like some sort of custom thing. Um, if you need something where you actually like need to like push like everything, or you have some other custom model or something that you want it to do something different, this gives you that ability. Um, and so again, that's inside of this volumetric press settings which are kind of defining how all of this works. Um, and then you saw it slowly returned. Um, there's a few different reasons, I guess, that happens. For example, if I, move, if I push the button down and then move my hand out of the collider, the button resume, or came back up to wherever it was. Um, and that's how that worked. The other thing we should check, sorry, I'm getting distracted, <laughs> but uh, I'm going to quickly revert these. So this is now the same as the other one. Um, we've kind of just undone what we did. Um, but again, extending speed and return speed are going to affect if you like leave the collider of that button, it's going to still make it work. But we can also try changing this, I think, into a toggle. And I think this should still work. <laughs> um, so we have now two additional options here that get enabled. We have on toggled and on detoggled which will cause things to different or to change when we do that. But we also should be able to actually use this now to actually toggle the button. And it should, I, my understanding is that that should stay depressed now. Um, so when we push the button, it should now stay depressed until we don't. Um, I'm curious if that's actually going to happen or if it's going to come back up and we'd need some other ind visual indicator that would be triggered by these toggled states. Because so I don't actually know how this works. <laughs> um, so. This is sort of how I figure these kinds of things out is actually try them. Um, it gives me a way to actually understand what's the experience going to be like for people and how is this actually going to like work um, and how does this uh, feel for people actually using this? Is this intuitive? Can people understand this? Um, and will this actually work with the sort of experience that I'm trying to actually build? Um, so let's try this. Uh, if we go into here, and run this. I should be able to swap over again. All right, so here are our buttons again. Uh, we can again push the yellow button, but if we push the green one, OK, so I've pushed it twice now. What I want to do is push it again and then exit. And see if it is toggled or not. It is not. Um, so I think I'm looking at something else. I also could be just missing something. Um, it's very hard <laughs> to be aware of everything going on when you have a VR headset on. Um, one of the advantages of using potentially a um, emulator or something like that. Uh, but there we go. <laughs> um, so that gives you, I guess, hopefully a few different examples of how this thing can be used. Um, again, it's open source. It's on GitHub, so you can go and you can go and try it. Um, this is also a very high level look. I am not an expert, <laughs> um, and this is definitely not a Here's how to use this and how, how good it is. This is intended as a me learning and hopefully helping you kind of learn along the way. Um, if that's helpful, 
um, then then let me know. Um, there are a lot of other examples here. We're not going to dive into all of them, uh, but there are different ways that you can interact with things. Um, so I believe this near menu example is going to actually provide a series of menus. Let's make these even smaller. There we go. Um, so this example team demonstrates various types of near interaction menus, um, which would be like things that are really close to you. Um, so I believe this is UI that is attached to the player that is not attached to the world, for example, unless you pin it, I believe. Uh, but this is literally the only knowledge I have of this. So I can't really say too much, um, but it does give you lots of different ways to kind of interact with all of these different things. Um, and it does the UI stuff for you, which was the part that I didn't know how to do. Um, so there's all of that. Um, and then looks like there's a spatial mapping example, which I will leave up to you <laughs> if you want to go and go and try that. Um, we do have uh, only a little bit of time left, so I'm going to quickly kind of show you how to find all of this again. <laughs> but uh, here's all the documentation inside of the packages. Um, if you go into here, this is sort of the landing page. We have a link for that that is actually going to kind of get you up to speed on how to get this started, how to actually install it, how to actually get started. Or I just said that, <laughs> but but how to actually get it into Unity and and actually start working with it inside of something that you're building, whether that's actually cloning the open source project with all the examples like I did or injecting it into a new pot project that you've built. Um, if you follow this setup, it seems to work. <laughs> so that's what I did to get ready for this is just run this setup and then uh, do a few quick tests to make sure everything was good. And then we started this stream. So um, that's that. Uh, we do have this. So um, giving us the ability to kind of clone the repository. That's this repository here. So if you're looking for this, here you go. Um, it's open source on GitHub. Um, just make sure when you're cloning this, you are looking at the correct branch. Um, so when you clone this, if I go into code and grab this link here, if I do a, uh, let me just make this bigger. Um, if I do a git clone of this, this is not the correct branch. Um, so we're going to end up on a different branch with a different version of everything, um, which is not probably what you want. So instead, make sure you actually clone and then just switch over to the correct branch. So you're actually looking at the correct version of the project. Um, and then you should be good to go. <laughs> um, so just something else to keep in mind. And then just open this up in Unity like you would any other project. Um, there are a number of packages here. Uh, skip past all that and go into Unity projects. And then open up this dev template as a Unity project. And that should have everything you need to actually get started and actually start playing around with this and using it yourself. Uh, but that is, I think, all the time I have. Um, we do have a really quick survey. So if you want to fill that out and let me know if you like this, if this was useful, um, that'd be great. <laughs> um, if this wasn't useful, if you, if you think we should do something else with this time, uh, also let us know. And that will give us a way to kind of change this and tweak this into something that's more useful for all of you, because um, that's why we do it. Um, so other than that, thank you everybody so much for watching and uh, hope you get a chance to try out this project. Um, so thanks. <laughs>